thank you, Lawrence, and uh, thank you, all of you, for, for coming to listen to me. The first lesson you're getting tonight, uh, so I can step away from this, see? Magic. <laughs> the first lesson you're getting tonight is in the variety of, uh, of habits that religious orders wear. You see the Benedictine habit and the Jesuit habit. <laughs> It may be that uh, Lawrence has been, I don't know whether it's softening you up or warming you up over the last few days, ready for tonight. Come to think of it, it couldn't have been warming. Uh, it was so cold in here. So perhaps he was softening you up for me. I want to say at the beginning um, a couple of negative things. That is to say, what not to expect uh, this is not going to be Islam 101. If you want Islam 101, then you can come and take my course in Washington, uh, but it takes a whole semester. And even then, with a lot of homework uh, and a lot of writing assignments, we still are only just scratching the surface. So I'm not uh, claiming that in the five sessions I have available that I can give you an introduction to Islam. I will give you uh, some books I can recommend, uh, a wonderful I iPad app, uh, which will lead you through. Uh, you have to pay for it, unfortunately. It's not mine, the money doesn't come to me. Uh, but there are lots of ways one can get information. But what I want to do uh, in these days with you is not that. Uh, I don't want to just stand up here and give you information that you could get in half a day with a book. What I would like to do is to uh, bring you into an experience I've had. It, uh, it just struck me as Lawrence was speaking uh, that it's, it's precisely 30 years, the year of the first uh, John Main seminar, that I I've had my first lesson on Islam. So maybe this is what it's all been working up to. <laughs> 30 years. But in those 30 years, uh, I've discovered, well, I've learned a lot about Islam and about Muslims, uh, but I've also learned a lot about being a Christian because we are who we are in relationship. We aren't who we are, or we aren't who we aren't. Mm. Anyway, you know what I mean? We, we don't exist in silos, we exist in relationship, and this is true of us as individuals, it's true of us as communities, it's true of us as nations, it's true of us in so many different respects. We are not closed off. We are who we are because of the network of relationships uh, in which we live, in which we stand. And so the study of Islam and uh, getting to know so many Muslims over these last 30 years has given me a different sense uh, of what it means to be a Christian. And that's something which used to be a kind of niche market, used to be sort of boutique, uh, a little boutique area of theology, which was done by some people in Cairo, and it was done here, and it was done there, and so on. But in the US of A, we didn't have to worry about that most of the time we were not thinking of ourselves as people fundamentally in relationship with Muslims. But the fact is, the way our world is today, we are, and we realize that one-fifth, approximately, of the world's population is Muslim. And uh, that means that if we wish to relate to the population of the world, and this, this also applies to the population of our cities, uh, the population of our small towns even, we have to understand who we are in relationship to Muslims. So it's not Islam 101 with all the, the rush of information that you might get with that. It's more about what it is like being Muslim and Christian together. Now, that's a this is a difficult time to be doing this. Uh, 
I'm, I'm an inveterate reader of the New York Times since 1989. I've pretty much done it every day. Uh, that was when I first came to New York to study. And uh, the New York Times has changed enormously in that time. Uh, you, you read the New York Times now and there's almost easily 50, 60 percent of, of the front part of the paper has Muslims as part of it, has struggle that we are, we are engaged in in various ways, has uh, accounts of the caliphate that they're trying to set up in Syria and Iraq. It has uh, all sorts of, of things. I would, I would never have imagined when I was asked to go into this field that the world would end up so intertwined in this way. And so it's a difficult time to be doing this because people sometimes think that uh, if you're in the business of, of speaking about Islam in any way which is not polemical or harshly critical or condemnatory, then you're somehow part of the problem that you are supporting terrorism, any other ism you care to mention. So it's a difficult time for all of us uh, to be engaged in something which is trying to be constructive, trying to be positive, trying to find a way forward. And so uh, I'm glad that I think most of you, perhaps not all of you, uh, have been meditating solidly for the last three days because it puts us in a good space. It puts us in a space of peace. It puts us in a space where, to recall Lawrence's words from the other day, the power of small. We are in uh, a time in our world where everybody's trying to prove themselves big. And so what we are about here uh, in, <clears throat> in these couple of days is to try and come to a new sense uh, of, of where we stand as Christians in relationship to Muslims. I'm not a political scientist, though, as I said, I do read the New York Times. Uh, I'm, I'm more of a theologian, but even I always uh, add that I'm an amateur theologian because my, my, my doctoral studies were in is Islam, not in, in Christian theology. But I did get ordained, so I got at least a smattering. <laughs> and uh, just a little sidebar, just to prove that I'm okay theologically. <clears throat> I was once giving a talk uh, on Islam three days to a group of Italian Jesuits. And uh, I started to give out my, my theory about the Trinity uh, in relationship to, to Islam. And one of them puts his hand up and he says, no, 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 he says, that's not right. That's not, that's not orthodox. And fortunately, at the, at the table, there happened to be Cardinal Martini, Carlo Maria Martini, and he defended me. So, <laughs> so <clears throat> you are in a great line. Uh, Cardinal Martini has been one of my students, and now. <laughs> so let's look at the title. Uh, Muslims and Christians, I could have said it another way. I could have said Islam and Christianity listening for the word. And that's a way that uh, we often hear this. I think I should have that off. T tell me if you can't hear because uh, I have hearing aids myself and I know what it's like. So uh, if anyone can't hear, just wave like that and I will. I'm not blind, I'm just deaf. <laughs> I could have said Islam and Christianity, and, and people do that all the time. Two abstract nouns in the singular. But I didn't do that. I, I preferred to call it <laughs> Muslims and Christians. Because they're people, we are people, and we are in the plural. And that peopleness and that plurality is enormously important. 
because so many of the attitudes that we have whether Muslims about Christians or Christians about Muslims, so many of the attitudes are based on the idea that there is a single entity. You know, that this person is a Muslim, therefore. This person is a Christian, therefore this follows. I mean, if you think of your own, uh, your own experience of being Christian, you know very well that there is a huge range of what it means to be Christian. You know that there are fundamentalist Christians, you know that there are Christians who scarcely really believe. Uh, you know that there are Christians who are violent, you know that there are Christians who are saints, you know that there are Christians who are millionaires, you know that there are Christians who live in slums. To say someone is a Christian is really not to give you very much information at all because there is such diversity among us. And the same is true when it comes to Muslims. We, we think we know what a Muslim is and yet uh, one of the first things we have to uh, grapple with is the fact that we're, there are about 1.2 billion of them and they are very, very different. Some of them are desperate that you should be afraid of them. Others are desperate to love you. But they both call themselves Muslim. So what makes someone a Muslim? I'll give you a bit of Arabic just, to, just for the taste. This is... Uh, this is the Muslim profession of faith. If you want to become a Muslim, this is what you say. La ilaha illa Allah wa Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God except God. And Muhammad is the messenger of God. Now the first part of it we can all agree with. There is only one God. Christians are monotheists very seriously. In a sense, you might say it's the second part which makes a Muslim a Muslim. It's the notion that the understanding of the uniqueness of God is primarily revealed through the revelation that was given to Muhammad and that the definitive way of understanding that revelation is the way he understood it. Now we all know, I think, the revelation that was given to him is called the Qur'an. It's a text. It's about, in length, it's about the same as the New Testament. Not very different. And yet, in so many other respects, it is quite different. Uh, has anyone, just for interest's sake, uh, tried to read the Quran right through? A few people. It's not easy, is it? It's not what we expect. It's not what we uh, think we're going to find when we open a book of scripture because it doesn't have uh, a narrative structure. It doesn't start right in the beginning. It starts really in the middle of an argument. It starts with all the characters on stage. It doesn't have a chronological structure. But that text, which is in a sense more than a text, is the, the primary thing that defines one as a Muslim. Having said Muhammad is the messenger of God, Muhammad was sent by God, that is to say you believe that that text was revealed by God. And that text is what God wants to communicate to us. And so Muslims are believers in a text. To be what it is to be a Muslim is to take this text as very central to your life. But the text, of course, comes with a prophet, and the prophet has his own sayings about 
what the text means, his own way of living in relationship to God's revelation. He gives his own example, he gives judgments. People remind, remember stories about him. These taken all together, they're, they're called hadith, these little snippets of, of tradition. The Quran and the Sunnah together, or the Quran and the collections of hadith together, are what we might call the text. And very often when we, when we deal with Muslims, and many Muslims themselves would say, well, that's it. You know, it's the text. That's what makes me a Muslim. But there are two other things that are inseparable from the text. So you can have the Quran. We know exactly how many words there are in it. We know exactly how long it is and what's there and what's not. You have this great body of sayings attributed to Muhammad, much more difficult to tie down, but you can collect them. They're, they're collected volumes that take up a few library shelves. But apart from the text, and as with any text, there's always what we might call a pretext. A pretext. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> when we read uh, the book of the prophet Isaiah as Christians, what is the pretext? Sorry, can't hear Paul. No, well, uh, the Torah. Okay, that's one one pretext. But but as Christians specifically. What, what, do we, what do we bring to the text of the prophet Isaiah? The New Testament, the gospel, the life and death, particularly the death and the suffering of Jesus. That's the pretext for us. We read exactly the same text as a Jew would read, uh, because that is in the Tanakh. But we read it in quite a different way because we bring a different pretext to it. We read the Old Testament, we call it, through the New Testament. A Jew, in fact, reads the Torah with the pretext, it's a later text of course, but it's the pretext of the Talmud. A Jew reads the text of the Torah that we find in the Bible from within a tradition which has already moved on and developed a lot more tradition. And so it is with Muslims. Muslims read the Quran not simply for pieces of information which are uh, in themselves discreet and unchanging. They bring, each Muslim brings a different pretext to it. So you might say, for example, there are some Muslims who, when they read the Quran, the pretext, the, the fundamental thing that they bring to the reading of, of the Quran, is a belief in the rationality of God, for example. God is completely rational. So, therefore, anything in the Quran that seems to be irrational is probably being misunderstood. What we bring to the text, in one sense, controls the text. the text. The text is no longer in control because we're bringing things to it. Sometimes as Catholics, we, we read the text of the New Testament with the pretext of centuries of tradition. So, for example, when we read in the Gospels about the, uh, the brothers and sisters of Jesus, we say, well, that doesn't mean that. It can't possibly mean that, because we read the text with the pretext of a tradition which says Mary was a virgin until she died. And so therefore, there are no brothers and sisters, so therefore that must mean something, they must be cousins. Or St. Joseph's first marriage 
he had children by his first marriage. All sorts of things, uh, when we read a text, particularly a religious text, we bring a pretext to it. And so it is for Muslims, and there are many Muslims for whom the pretext, the fundamental commitment they bring to the reading of the Quran, is the loving unity of God. That would be the case for Sufis who are reading the text of the Quran. The, they presume, they're fundamentally committed to the idea that God's word given in, in the Quran must be a word about God's unity, it must be a word about God's love, it must be a word about the unification of the believer with God in love. That's presumed, that's the pretext. And then there's the context. Now, we know what context is in our normal sense of the word, but there's this sense of context which is, uh, let's say it's all the texts that go with this, all the texts that have already responded to this text. So, for example, uh, a 19th century Catholic theologian who took the risk of actually opening the Bible <laughs> would, would have had as his context, that is the text that go along with it, the Summa of St. Thomas. He would have had the writings of the fathers. He would have had so many other texts which create a kind of a network of understanding. Uh, and so the text, uh, however much we might be, we might think of ourselves as fundamentalists, whether Muslims or Christians or, or Jews or any other kind of fundamentalists, there's no getting away from the fact that the text to which we're so devoted in this case the Quran and the Sunnah together, is necessarily read with a pretext, and it also comes in with a whole set of contexts, if you like. Now sometimes we throw out all the contexts, for example in the Reformation, uh, people decided it's important to get back to the reading of the scripture without all this stuff of the Catholic tradition. It's important for the believer to have access to the text of scripture and to be able to engage with it. But then of course gradually more contexts arise. Luther's table talk, the writings of Calvin, and so on it goes. The text generates contexts. So it's very important for us uh, in trying to keep in mind that we're dealing with plurality and diversity of, with Muslims, it's important to keep in mind that any person who, who sees herself as a Muslim is functioning in, in these three areas. Certainly, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet are key, but then the pretext that's brought to it or the contexts that surround it uh, may utterly change things almost beyond recognition to other Muslims. So there are, there's no shortage of Muslims as there are no shortage of Christians uh, who are ready to denounce the other as not really a Muslim or not really a Christian or not really a Jew. And so it goes. But for us, it's not our role to decide who are the real Muslims and who are not. You, you tend to get people these days who, if you talk about someone, a Muslim who wants to make peace, or you talk about a Muslim who is, uh, who is very interested in interreligious dialogue, and so, oh yes, but the real Muslims are the ones in the Islamic State in, in Iraq and Syria. They're the real Muslims because they have the text. They're the real Muslims because they focus just on those few verses in the text that we consider the most threatening. 
But even those uh, hateful people and hate-filled people there are bringing a pretext to their reading of the text. Even those hate-filled people there have a, a series of contexts that shape the way they read the Quran. And none of those things gives them the right to be the real Muslims. <clears throat> so, the question is, the uh, question before us tonight is, what about a word in common? What can we say together? I want to, uh, some of you may be aware of this because I know some of you work a lot in interfaith work. <coughs> when uh, Pope Benedict made his rather ill-starred speech in, uh, in Regensburg uh, some years ago, uh, he angered a, a great many Muslims. Uh, one of the things which came out of it was a letter written by uh, a small group of Muslims um, 37, I think they were. I always get this number mixed up because my office number is, is 139. And I think it was 37. They didn't really get an answer to that letter. It was a very respectful letter saying, well, we read your speech and you know, we think there was this mistake in it and that mistake in it and so on. But let's talk. And perhaps a good place for us to begin our discussion would be with the dual commandment to love. That could be a basis for Muslim-Christian dialogue. They didn't re really get any, any response. Just a thank you note from the Secretary of State. And so one year later to the day, they added a hundred more signatories and they wrote a bigger letter uh, and added a hundred signatories <coughs> and sent it same day, had a hundred more. And they called it a common word. And uh, if you're interested in this project, it's been going on since then, trying to, to gather momentum. You can find it a very ample website, uh, a common word.org. And in this letter, uh, they, they referred to uh, a text of, of the Quran which says, which, tells the Prophet to say that God is the speaker of the Quran, tells the, tells the Prophet to say, O oh, people of the scripture, come to a word common between us and you, that we worship none but God, and associate none as partner with God, and that none of us take others for lords apart from God. <coughs> and so they took this and they said, let us see if we can't come to a word in common. Let us see if we can't find something that we can affirm together that will create the basis for mutual understanding and for collaboration. And they said, well, probably a good idea that they didn't, didn't start saying, please sign on this dotted line, uh, because I think that I, I, as a Christian, I have no problem with that affirmation of faith. But uh, I think many Muslims think that I do, but we can get to that uh, in another session. This is usually taken to be a kind of a throwing down the gauntlet to Christians, saying, you know, give up this business of Trinity and just agree with us that there's only one God. And we say, we believe in the Trinity, one God. But they said, let's, let's see if we can start with this as the basis for our common word. It, it should begin, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And Jesus, when he was asked about the greatest commandment, said, this is the greatest commandment. And he added, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these, he said, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so they said, well, those two texts come from the Tanakh, 
Well, they both come from the Torah, in fact, uh, from the Pentateuch. The first one is from Deuteronomy. The second one is from Leviticus. So Jews, Jews have them in their scriptures. Jesus quoted them as being the greatest commandments. And then they went into an exposition of how they believed that these, uh, even though the words do not appear in the Quran, how from the Quran and the teaching of the Prophet, this could, these two uh, commandments could be understood as being the foundation of Islam. And so they said, let's agree on these two commandments as being the essence of our three religious traditions, and we'll go from there. Now, everyone said, well, that seems a good idea. Uh, if I were to do a straw poll, uh, how, many, how many people would agree that Jesus' teaching about the love of God and the love of neighbor could be taken as a kind of, well, perhaps could we call it the heart of the gospel, the heart of his teaching? Who would say that? Just as I thought. <clears throat> I'm glad you're here. You've come to the right place. <clears throat> No, I, I, have, I don't have any problem with those as commandments. Uh, but the problem was, you know, uh, in, according to Matthew and according to Luke, uh, when Jesus was asked that question about the greatest commandments, they were trying to trap him. He was in a, an argument with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and in one case, the fact he was playing one side off against the other, at the argument about, you know, uh, Whose wife will she? Whose husband? Whose wife will she be when she gets there? Because she's had seven husbands, and etc. etc. They were always out to trap him, and so they ask him a trick question, and he gives this answer. In fact, I think it's in Luke. He doesn't. He doesn't uh, answer himself. He says to the the person who asked him, he said, "Well, what do you what do you see in the in the Torah?" And he said, well, I see this and, and this. And Jesus says, okay, go and do it. The trick answer to a trick question doesn't seem to me to qualify as the heart of the gospel. In Mark's version of the story, uh, yes, the argument is going on, but, but there's a lawyer there who, who is very impressed with the way Jesus is handling this conflict. And he says to him, he says, tell me more, tell me what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, gives this answer. He says, yes, yes, you're right. You know, to love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and your neighbors. Your soul. This, is, this is it. And do you remember Jesus' answer to him? Anyone? Remember, I'm hard of hearing. Not far from the kingdom of heaven. You are not far from the kingdom of heaven. Not far, but not there. <laughs> not far, but not there. Because if we think that the incarnation took place simply so that Jesus could come and do a cut and paste job on a Torah that was rather too long, we say, well, let's just take a verse out of, out of Deuteronomy and we get another verse out of Leviticus and that'll be fine. On that depends all the law and the prophets. And well, that's it, really. Uh, bye. Is that, is that what the gospel is saying to us? Is the gospel simply repeating two snippets of the Hebrew Bible and saying, now you know what you've got to do. I know you'd forgotten, but the word of God has become flesh to quote the Old Testament to you? I don't think so. This, uh, this is key for me. Um, it's very easy in, in interfaith work because of the goodwill that we bring to it and because of the not just goodwill but love indeed that we bring to it and the love we find there 
we want to do something like a common word was trying to do, to bring people together in a fundamental agreement. And this seemed to be a great way of doing it, and, and it's about love, which is even better. Love for God and love for our neighbor. Yet it seems to me that uh, somehow we've, we've, slipped, we've slipped into an area where we've lost what is unique to, to the Christian message. There's no doubt it's all, in all the Gospels, at least it's in the Synoptic Gospels. John, who, who has a lot about love, doesn't have precisely this, but he's really in all his stuff about loving God and loving one another and so on, he's really working these two verses over. But the key, I think, to the gospel is not what we should be doing. We, we knew what we should be doing and we know what we should be doing. The key to the gospel, which makes it precisely good news, is that even though we haven't been doing what we are doing, we are still loved. The key to the gospel is that even when God comes among us and we shout, crucify him, the deal is not off. The heart of the good news is, is not a couple of, a shortened version of the commandments that make it all a little easier, though those are not easy. The heart of the gospel is the message of how God loves us so much, we're moving away from the synoptics to John now, how God loves us so much that God is even prepared to bear the fact that we hate God. Not just that we don't love God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind, but that some of us, and many of us at times, get to the point of hating God. To the point of wanting to kill. And that the response to that was not, okay, I've had enough, the whole thing is over, I'm wiping you all out, send another flood, I know I promised rainbows and all that. but. This is too much. There is no this is too much for God. That is the heart of the gospel. I, I love a line that Rowan Williams has in one of his books uh, called Tokens of Trust. <coughs> he talks about uh, the all might be God. You know, we, we say all, almighty God as though meaning God can do anything. God can throw anyone around. God can beat anyone in a fist fight. Uh, God's bigger than your father. Uh, so, no, the all might be God. You, you know, when, when people say, well, I know this is a complete mess. You just, you know, you just dropped that cake on the floor and the guests are about to arrive. We might be able to make this with it. I know you just burnt that, but we might be able to... There is... God is an all-might-be God. That is, God is never outfoxed. God is never at a loss. To say God is almighty is not to say that God is tougher than anybody else. It's to say that God is never at a loss. There is always a... There might be... There is always another possibility. There's always another chance. There's always another way of going at it. And that is at the heart of the gospel. That the all might be God, who is never, never at a loss for possibilities, that's the God we see in the cross. And so if we want to come to a common word about what is the heart of our faith in God, what is the heart of God's message to us, then we can't simply be drawn into something which says, well, yes, it's two simple commandments. There's something much more wondrously strange 
about the gospel than simply a cut and paste job on the Old Testament with some very interesting parables thrown in. There is something much weirder, something much more world turning upside down-ish about the gospel than simply a simplified version of the law and the prophets. And so I don't want our common word with Muslims to be, okay, let's agree on a short set of, of commandments, even though they're very good ones. Jesus says they were the best of commandments. But that's when you're talking commandments. We're not talking commandments, we're talking gospel. What is the best news? The best news is that Good Friday was not the last day of humanity. The best news is that the one who was strung up when, and nailed up, that when he rose, he rose with those nail holes still there, and he raised a hand not to slap, but to bless. And he said to those people who denied him, Peter denied three times even that he knew him, said to him, peace, peace. That's the heart of the gospel. And it's something that in, in this conversation with Muslims, we can't simply let go of. It doesn't make us any better than anybody else. It doesn't belong to us. Jesus doesn't wish peace just to Christians. Jesus didn't die for Christians. Jesus didn't incarnate God's love just for Christians, but for all people. And we are the ones who happen to have seen it. By and large, it hasn't made us any better. Sometimes it does. We are the ones who recognize in Jesus something fundamental about God, which is, we thought at the time, unexpected, but when we go back and look at the scriptures, lo and behold, we discover it wasn't unexpected. It's just we hadn't been thinking of God that way. And that's our role. Our role is not to say, okay, we'll join you in, in following commandments. But our role is to say, no, commandments are good, but they only go so far. Commandments can't save you. The only thing that can save us is the fact that God does not give us what, <coughs> pardon me, what we deserve. The only thing that saves us is the fact that that hand that has been pierced is raised in blessing and not to slap. That's what saves us. And so it's a lot more complex, this, this relationship. Some people, I, I remember I, I gave this talk, uh, it was I think the strangest room I've ever given a talk in. Uh, it was the, the trophy room of the New York Yacht Club. <laughs> It's this huge Beaux-Arts uh, incredible thing with all these models of, of, the, of the boats that had sailed for the America's Cup uh, over, the, over the decades. And it had a fireplace that was, yes, as high as this ceiling. So I, I mean, the, the fireplace itself was as high as that screen. And then there was a, a big painting on top of it. it was, it's such a weird room. But, I was spinning this kind of line. I, I was talking to them, I was talking to a group of benefactors uh, for the Gregorian University where I used to teach in Rome. And uh, I thought I would really prod them. I knew they wouldn't like it, but it, it got the conversation going. I, I, I titled my talk, What I Learned from Muslims at the Gregorian. And it was true because I, I, I had lots of Muslim students there who, who came to study Christianity and I learned a lot in this conversation because they wanted to know from me, well, what precisely is Christianity? What, what really do you believe? Why do you believe that? But 
you said that and then you said this other thing, how do they go together? I learned a huge amount of, of theology simply by having to respond to those very well-meaning, uh, very innocent questions. And I discovered, of course, that, that Christian students had the same questions they didn't dare to ask because it was presumed that everybody who was a Christian was supposed to know the answer to that. But the Muslim student would ask the question and the Christian would go, yeah, yeah. But. <laughs> so after this talk in the, in the weird room, these people came up to me and they said, oh, we really like what you said. Uh, don't you think that, that uh, Christianity is so much better because Jesus said, love your enemies and not just love your neighbor? And I said, wait, wait, what do you mean exactly? What they meant was, well, Christians are so much better than Muslims because Jesus said to love your enemies. Um, that would be a no. Uh, it doesn't make us any better, the fact that Jesus said this. It doesn't, it, it's no reason why we should be puffed up. and say, oh, well, you know, of course, you, know. you can make some kind of argument that these, these are the heart of, of uh, Islam, but, you know, the heart of Christianity is, is to love your enemies. Well, have we actually done it? I mean, you're, you're actually using this, I said to them, to make yourself higher than, than the Muslims who you despise. So you, you use the command to love your enemies as a pretext for despising people. Uh, do you not see? So when, when we come into this conversation, it's not just, and, and we say, no, we don't want to buy into this common word of, of commandments. It's not because we're better than them. It's not because we should be proud that, that Jesus uh, was who he was because Jesus did what he did for all, not just for Christians. We're just the ones who happen to believe it. It doesn't always transform us, as I said, but we, we believe it and we, we encourage people to see it because we think it's good news. And that ought to lead us, I think, uh, to a word that we can have in common. Because if I think honestly enough and, and seriously enough about uh, what Jesus has done, if I think seriously enough about what love God has shown to us in, in drawing us into the divine life, then it ought to create in me uh, a profound sense of shame. I don't mean Catholic guilt or Jewish guilt or any of those other kinds of guilt. No, but a profound sense of shame because I'm not worthy. I haven't done enough to earn this. I haven't done anything to earn it. It's freely given. I haven't truly allowed it to transform me. I'm still pretty much how I was. From time to time, you know, grace has its way with me. But the, the truth of the gospel ought to make us say, and it does, we do it every time we gather to celebrate Eucharist. It ought to make us say, Lord, have mercy. It ought to make us say, mea culpa. And that, I think, is the common word we're looking for. The common word we're looking for is not a word about our ideals or even commandments that enshrine those ideals but rather a common word of, <clears throat> of repentance, an honest word about our failure, an honest word about the huge gap between the love God has, the graciousness of God, and our own small-heartedness. 
And it seems to me that, uh, let's just talk about Muslim-Christian dialogue for the moment. One of the things which has bedeviled Muslim-Christian dialogue in, the, in my experience of it over the last 30 years is that we're always talking to each other about ideals. And we say, oh, you believe in peace, we believe in peace too. Isn't that interesting? That's, that's great. Oh, you believe in love, we believe in love too, See, as witness. We hold out our ideals to the other people and we say, look at that, this is ours. As though it's a museum. Don't touch it. Don't probe too much into what Christians say about love. Don't probe too much into what Muslims say about, about peace. We, we get together in rooms and we show each other these museum pieces of our ideals. And meanwhile, of course, everyone's thinking in the back of their mind, oh, yeah, right, uh -huh. sure, peace, Islam is a religion of peace, uh -huh. mm -hmm. sure. But you can't say that because it's, this is interfaith dialogue. But this is the way it goes. Uh, I was, you know, you, from time to time you get, you get people who burst out in a, in a, in a fit of honesty. And uh, we were uh, following this, there, was, uh, there were some conferences and one of them was at Cambridge University. It was convened by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And, uh, Prince Ghazi of Jordan, who was, who was big in this movement. And uh, you know, we were having these discussions about love and so on. <coughs> and uh, one of the Christians said something that uh, you know, he, he, was, he was unhappy about, about uh, the way Muslim immigrants were behaving in Germany and so on. And, and one of the other, I don't think it was the, it might have been the Prince, anyway, I, I won't attribute it to him. It was somebody else or somebody else, uh, said, yes, but what about all those children who aren't safe from the priests? Fair comment. We sit there and we talk about our ideals, but the reality, the reality is so far from the ideal. Islam is a region of peace. Yes, but what about those people being beheaded in, in Iraq? So we can't, we can't afford to go on this way just talking about our ideals because there's a fundamental, I mean, what we say is, is not wrong. I mean, it's certainly true that, that uh, this is what, the, what people believe and this is, this is what we do aspire to. But the reality is so far from what we aspire to that the only genuine dialogue, I think, is going to start taking place when we can acknowledge to each other our failure, rather than fronting up, speaking of our ideals, and the other person is thinking of our failures. And then they speak of their ideals, gritting their teeth because they're, they're so angry about what we've been saying, and then we're thinking, oh, yeah. It's, it happens again and again. What is the word we are looking for in common? I think if we're going to be honest and if we're going to get anywhere, I think that's the word we're looking for. Well, two words. Maybe that ought to be our mantra for, for interfaith dialogue. To get some sense of the reality of who we are. Because when we do that, the gospel can address us more clearly. If we stay at the level of commandments and ideals, somehow that doesn't touch the reality of our failure. It's really only the word of the cross that touches profoundly the reality of our failure and can transform it. 